Lecture 2 in the Practice of Cardiac Sonography 4 unit is entitled Evaluating Prosthetic Valves, Endocarditis and the Aorta. The contents of the lecture 1. Imaging prosthetic valves with echocardiography 2. Echocardiographic features of endocarditis and thirdly imaging the aorta with echocardiography. The learning outcomes. Following this lecture, you will be able to execute the essential images required to evaluate prosthetic and bioprosthetic heart valve function and discern the key echocardiographic features of infective endocarditis and of specific diseases of the aorta. The textbooks, chapters 13, 14 and 16 of Catherine Otto's textbook and chapters 15, 16 and 19 of Alice Dare Riding's textbook are essential reading for the lecture. Imaging prosthetic valves. Evaluation of prosthetic valves by echocardiography is similar to the evaluation of native valves and involves both 2D and Doppler methods. The three main differences are 1. Prosthetic valves are typically more difficult to image especially with 2D. Secondly, the fluid dynamics are different to native valves and are different among prosthetic valves. And thirdly, valve dysfunction differs to native valve dysfunction. 2D imaging of mechanical valves can be a challenge due to the artifacts they often cause. The most common artifacts are shadowing, like the illustration on this slide, or reverberation, like the artifact seen on the 2D image on this slide. Two D imaging of bioprosthetic valves is usually less challenging than mechanical valves. Stented valves have a characteristic appearance. Often the valve struts are well seen. The arrows on the two larger images on this slide point to the struts and valve orifice of a bioprosthetic stented valve. The smaller images on this slide are before and after images of a patient with a calcified aortic valve replaced with a bioprosthetic valve. The arrows on the second smaller image point to the valve cage. Stent less and homographed valves often appear very similar to native valves. Doppler imaging of mechanical valves. Mechanical valves have higher velocities compared to native valves and in general the smaller the valve the higher the velocity. A baseline gradient for all patients post valve replacement is very useful as it provides a reference measurement for subsequent exams. The spectral Doppler profile of a mechanical valve may be triangular, which is normal. And opening and closing clicks are another normal part of the spectral display of mechanical valves. Published normal values for mechanical aortic valves are displayed on this slide and available in Catherine Otto's textbook. Notice that the highest peak and mean gradients are in the smaller valves. Measurement of the effective orifice area, EOA, using the continuity equation is made in the same way as measuring the aortic valve area for a native valve. For prosthetic valves, 
care should be taken to measure the LVOT diameter just underneath the prosthesis to the outer margins of the sewing ring. Published normal values for mechanical mitral valves are displayed on this slide. Again, these values are from Catherine Otto's text. Notice that the peak and mean gradients in mechanical mitral valves are lower and less variable than for mechanical aortic valves. Doppler imaging of bioprosthetic valves. Bioprosthetic valves have a Doppler profile similar to a native valve. However, the flow velocity is normally increased compared to a native valve. As with mechanical valves, a baseline measurement for all patients post valve replacement is very useful as it can serve as a valve fingerprint for future examinations. And as with mechanical valves, the effective orifice area for a biprosthetic aortic valve is calculated in the same way as the aortic valve area is for a native valve, that is, using the continuity equation. Again, published normal values for bioprosthetic aortic valves are displayed on this slide and available in Catherine Otto's textbook. Notice that the highest peak and mean gradients are once more in the smaller valve sizes. And published normal values for bioprosthetic mitral valves are also available via Catherine Otto's textbook. And as with the peak and mean gradients in mechanical mitral valves, the values are lower for bioprosthetic mitral valves than they are for bioprosthetic aortic valves. Mechanical and bioprosthetic aortic valve stenosis. As mentioned in the Principles of Cardiac Sonography lecture, stenosis of mechanical valves is most often due to thrombus formation or ingrowth of a fibrous material called panis. Stenosis of bioprosthetic valves, on the other hand, is usually the result of slow, progressive tissue degeneration resulting in increased valve resistance to opening. Assessment of stenosis for both types of prosthetic aortic valve, that is mechanical and bioprosthetic, is almost identical. Indications of prosthetic aortic valve stenosis include a significantly increased peak velocity when compared with previous studies. Increased gradients with regards to normal reference ranges and a decreased EOA where an EOA less than 0.8 centimeters squared is very suggestive of significant prosthetic aortic valve stenosis. Assessment of stenosis for both types of prosthetic mitral valve, that is mechanical and bioprosthetic valves, is also very similar. Indications of prosthetic mitral valve stenosis include a significantly increased gradient compared with previous studies, a mean gradient greater than 10 millimeters of mercury and an effective orifice area less than one centimeter squared, which is again very highly suggestive of significant prosthetic mitral valve stenosis. Prosthetic valve regurgitation. Assessment of pathologic regurgitation for both types of prosthetic aortic valve is once more very similar for both valve types. Some points to remember when assessing for significant regurgitation include 
Large regurgitant jets are not normal. Eccentric regurgitant jets are not normal. And a regurgitant jet that originates from around the valve sewing ring, that is a paravalvular regurgitation, is not normal either. The parasternal short axis view may be best for grading a paravalvular leak where an estimate can be made of the extent of the regurgitation compared to the circumference of the sewing ring, wherein a regurgitant extension of around 10% is mild, 10 to 20% moderate, and more than 20% is severe. prosthetic mitral valve regurgitation. The detection of pathologic prosthetic mitral valve regurgitation is once more similar for both mechanical and bioprosthetic valves, although it's often more difficult for mechanical valves, especially if there is significant reverberation or shadowing in this case, ways of trying to identify significant mitral, re mitral regurgitation by transthoracic echo include identifying an elevated mitral valve E wave greater than 1.9 meters per second, a dense continuous wave Doppler regurgitant jet, and an elevated pulmonary artery systolic pressure estimate. Of course, transesophageal echo is indicated if significant prosthetic mitral regurgitation is suspected. Another point to remember when assessing regurgitation. A small amount of transvalvular regurgitation is normal for both prosthetic and bioprosthetic valves. For example, with bileaflet prosthetic valves, two small jets of regurgitation are common, and these jets are sometimes referred to or termed washing jets, as they prevent blood stasis, and they are typically short in length and of low turbulence. Imaging when endocarditis is suspected. The hallmark feature of infective endocarditis is an independently mobile mass attached to a valve or part of the endocardium. An independently mobile mass is a mass with movement that is very apparent and may be somewhat chaotic. A significant valvular mass often leads to a functional abnormality as well, especially to valvular regurgitation. Common locations for valvular masses to occur are the atrial side of the mitral valve and the ventricular side of the aortic valve. Endocard endocarditis can lead to leaflet destruction as seen on the color image on this slide and endocarditis may involve more than one valve at a time. On echo, an abscess is recognized by an area of localized thickening. This area may be echogenic, echolucent, or both. On rare occasions, an abscess or aneurysm may erode. If erosion does occur and a shunt develops, it's a very serious complication. The development of a shunt can be recognized by abnormal and turbulent blood flow with color Doppler, as seen in the pulmonary artery in the image on this slide indicative or consequent
to a shunt that's developed from an aortic aneurysm into the pulmonary artery. As mentioned in the Principles of Cardiac Sonography lecture, non-biological material is prone to infection. Pacing leads and central lines are two such examples. Of course, care should be taken to correctly identify pacing leads and central lines and not mistake them for a mass. Also mentioned in the principles of cardiac sonography lecture was the fact that detection of prosthetic valve endocarditis, that is endocarditis that occurs on a prosthetic valve, can be difficult with transthoracic echo. Two features which may lead you to be suspicious that there is involvement of a prosthetic valve include significant valvular regurgitation or evidence of valvular instability. Imaging the aorta. Images of the aorta are an important part of all routine echocardiograms. The aortic root, sinotubular junction, ascending aorta and aortic arch, as well as the descending thoracic and abdominal aorta can be, can be imaged with transthoracic echocardiography. Optimal images may require the sonographer to move the probe to alternate rib spaces away from where standard images are acquired or to move the patient into a position more conducive to acquiring clear images. Different parts of the aorta can be seen from all four standard imaging windows. That is, the aorta can be imaged from the parasternal, apical, suprasternal and subcostal windows. And it's important for a sonographer to be familiar with all of these views. The size of the aortic root, sinotubular junction and ascending aorta and the aortic arch should be of concern always, especially if there's a history of hypertension, bicuspid aortic valve or a connective tissue disorder. The two most important imaging windows in these cases are the parasternal and suprasternal windows. And the most important views are the parasternal long axis view and the suprasternal long axis view. Remember that from the parasternal long axis view, measurements of the, a the aorta need to be made leading edge to leading edge. Pulse wave Doppler measurements acquired from the suprasternal and subcostal views provide additional information for grading aortic valve regurgitation. From the suprasternal view, the PW sample volume is positioned in the middle of the aorta, just below the origin of the left subclavian artery. From the subcostal view, 2D and colour are needed to ensure that the PW sample volume is placed in the middle of the abdominal aorta where it's best seen. On the two images on this slide, reverse flow, which occurs during diastole, in both the thoracic and abdominal aorta can be seen. Reverse flow in the abdominal aorta is indicative of severe aortic regurgitation. Aortic dissection is a serious complication that results in the development of a false lumen into which blood can travel. 2D and Doppler images are required to determine the location of the tear in the lumen 
the extent of the dissection and blood flow within the aorta. Perhaps the most serious complication that results from aortic disease is aortic rupture. Prompt 2D and Doppler images can help to identify the site of dissection and the direction of blood flow. In conclusion, this lecture has included aspects of images required to evaluate prosthetic and bioprosthetic heart valve function and key echocardiographic features of infective endocarditis and of specific diseases of the aorta.